Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the newest voice of MMA, the legend Teddy Atlas. Teddy, welcome back from Vegas. You killed it all weekend in, uh, with the MMA coverage. I loved every second of it. Tons of uh, kind words from all the a MMA fans in Vegas. How was it? Yeah, no, it was great. Listen, I appreciate all the kind words. <laughs> and I appreciate the the real MMA UFC crew, you know, Rogan and Bisbane and, and Dominic and... Uh, John Anik. John Anik and a, and a great lady that does it. Um, uh, thinking of her name. She, I mean... Uh, she does a tremendous job. She she hosts one of the shows uh, with them. Uh, of course, uh, DC, uh, all of them. I mean, every single one of them is not only good at what they do and verse at their sport, obviously, their profession, but they're all class, every one of them. And I, I just appreciate them allowing this uh, boxing peon <laughs> this 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 boxing uh you know uh, uh caveman uh <laughs> you know to come into their sport and so graciously as they do uh to to allow this this you know this peasant um of their sport because i am i'm a peasant but you know <laughs> yeah, crazy. Uh, uh, but you know and they they're good enough to allow me to come you know from another place and and be so open and welcoming and uh make me feel good so that that for me that's where it starts and you know i have nothing but respect obviously i come from boxing 45 years actually it's more than 45 but we'll keep it at 45 and um <laughs> you know I, I have nothing but respect for these gladiators uh and they're gladiators and, you know, so I have nothing but respect for the sport, for what they do, for, you know, what they face all the time when they get in that octagon inside that cage. And I appreciate, again, the just just the level of competence and, and as I said, pure class that all their people uh, work with. And... It was nice, you know, it was nice to have the fans coming up to me and say, hey, we're glad to have you here, Teddy, you know. You, you Megan, to... Me Megan Olivi is the woman that you were yeah, talking Megan. about, by the yeah. way. Yeah, yeah Megan. she does a great job. Oh, she's tremendous. She, she really is. They all are. And as I said, they're not only good at what they do, but they do it in a classy way. And just, it's just nice to be around good people. And, you know, and the fans were so just so gracious and saying, Daddy, yeah, we're glad to have you over here. You know, so it was, uh, you know, they were, a few of them remembered the old Friday night times they were coming up to me going, Teddy, bang, bang. <laughs> and I'm like, oh, oh, all right, you know. Uh, and, uh, but it was, it was an event. It was a great event. It was great to see the crowd in that arena. To, to see us getting back to that normalcy, you know, Ken, that was great too, to, to hear that crowd, to feel that crowd, to, to see them all together with no masks, you know, yeah. getting back to like, you know, normal life uh, and living normal life. I, I don't, what I get confused a little bit about, I'm not going to go deep into it, but man, you got, how many people were there? 15,000? 21,000. Oh my God. So 21,000 people in there with no mask, beautiful, back to life. And and then you go to the airport and you got to have a mask on. <laughs> I, I mean, I mean, they I'm were trying, like, uh, I'm not Teddy, a Teddy, they were crazy. At the uh, Delta Lounge, the woman was started snapping at me and I said, oh shit, the vaccine doesn't work in here. And she's like, what are you trying to get it? I go, well, if I'm vaccinated and the vaccine works, I'm not at risk, you're not at risk, but I get it. If the vaccine, you know, maybe it doesn't work in here. Anyway, it's, I digress. No, we could, no, this no, is, I mean, we could talk true. forever about this. You're, you're allowed to be around 21,000 people on top of each other, you know, and, and you go and walk in an airport, you better have a mask on. Uh, uh, you better, and then you get on an airplane, you better have your mask on. I, I was just. And don't let uh, it slip off your nose. No. I, I will I, punch I, it for you. <laughs> I mean, and, and not to mention that right next to us was the Raiders Arena where there was 70,000 people at a Golf Brooks concert with no Yeah, mask. yeah, yeah, yeah. So 
hey what, what am I? Like I said earlier, I'm a boxing caveman. Uh, so <laughs> obviously I can't figure those things out. Can I, I can just figure out fighting. Uh, to can a, I tell you? Can I tell you? We forgot. We There were so many things that we took for granted prior to COVID because true. on Friday I was out there obviously as well. And uh, Friday night I went to see um, Rogan and Chappelle at the MGM Grand. Oh, my God. It was awesome. It was to just be back around people in a big crowd. Um and 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 the fans the mma fans and the fans of this show are so unbelievable it's so humbling i love everybody they're so nice they they they, they love the show so much and everyone is so kind so the nice. people on twitter not so much but the people when you see them in the streets my god i just want to say like i love everybody that follow that follows oh, along great. and watches the show it was so humbling to see people i'm so honored every time someone sees us and recognizes us i'm like oh my god thanks for all the support the people so that they love you every person i see tell teddy i said this tell teddy i said that if i relate all the messages teddy i'd be like i just might as well just have a pocket recorder with me i'm like okay i'll tell him this tell him that sure okay so just know everyone says they love you bang bang uh keep this up and they want us if i uh, tell you all the requests that they want us to do a, a fight companion or break down the different fights just rob if you could tee up every single fight that's ever happened in mma they want them that's all. all the bad that's ones all. the good ones <laughs> that's all it's so if you're listening your request is submitted we want them all i get it we got it we'll do them all and i'm so glad that the people see when they they you know when people in person and I won't go into this deep, but you touched on it. My back is bothering me. But you touched on it. Um, the people in person, you know, they can tell you really how they feel. And, it, and they tell you truthfully. The people that sometimes, and I'm not looking to attack anyone, but there's people out there on the internet that they can hide. They can hide some of them. And listen, there's beautiful people on the internet. I know that. We know that. We get beautiful comments. And and like Rob says to me, and he reminds me, he says, Teddy, it's usually not this kind of percentage, but with, with our show, really, 95% of the comments, maybe more, maybe 98% are good. They're positive. You're always yeah. going to get the That's people. True. You're always going to get the trolls, as my son says. And listen, not just the trolls and the, and the sickles and, and stuff. Some of them are a little wacky. They're in their underwear in the basement basement and they're you know they're, they're, they're not getting out enough they're not getting out enough and they're they're looking to pick on somebody they look maybe 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 they have a gripe with life in general i don't know and they get mad some of them some of them but then the other ones with their opinions and stuff i acknowledge them i i i acknowledge that everyone has an opinion and a right to an opinion and i respect it and they can ha hate us or like us hey but you know do it in a proper way and but it's always it's always nicer when you put a face to it because then you know you're getting genuinely what the person really feels because again sometimes people can you know they can be away on the internet where you don't know who they are you don't have to deal with them and they can they can be mean they can say things and listen uh, you can say things that are negative. You can, but you don't have to go to that mean spirited place. Um, you really don't. Just like Connor, we'll get into it more. Connor probably didn't obviously have to go to where he went with some of the stuff, and we'll get into that um, with some of that. You know, you can be a promoter. You can be. You can be. Uh, you know, the notorious one, but you can also do it uh, within a realm. Of, of some kind of proper realm of decency, uh, you of know, and not, and not go too far. But the point that I'm making is that all the people, the people on the internet that send out the comments, good or bad, we appreciate you all. We appreciate, obviously, we love you more that you sent out the good ones, and, we, and we're very, <laughs> of course, we're human. And listen, we're very grateful for it. We're very grateful for it. And we always know that we're not perfect, um, we're, but we're honest. We're telling you how we feel. That's all. And to your point, and, and I'm so glad to hear that from you because you're a good person and you deserve to be treated decent. Uh, seriously. And it goes to show you that, yeah, sometimes some people may take shots, you know, and that's part of it. That's part of living in a big apple, baby, you know. But when they see you in person, they're really telling you because there is no 
buffer. There, there is no, you know, being a thousand miles away. They're right there in front of you, and they're telling you what they really feel. And I'm glad that they've said nice things to you because uh, I guess those people realize what a sensitive uh, person you are. You know, and, <laughs> and, and and it's so nice that that they understand that some of the other ones that are far away, they they don't give a damn. But um, <laughs> I think everyone is a little bit sensitive. Just some people aren't confident enough to tell you that they're sensitive. Everyone is human. We all have feelings. Some people just don't want you to know that they have uh, that their feelings are tend more tender than they are. And the uh, other thing is, listen, you're hundred percent with that. There are people out there that uh it's a it's a form of insecurity i guess but they 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 act like they don't care you know like yeah. like they don't care and it's a protective device you know if if i understand anything i understand fighting and i understand human nature because i couldn't understand fighting to the level that i do and have to over all the years if i didn't understand human nature and how it works uh, they go hand in hand they're connected you know so it it was Again, it was it was great being with the UFC royalty, and that they again that they allowed me to to be part of their world uh, with all the post fight stuff that I did. You know, I thought I was leaving at one point. Charlie Monahan, the great producer, does all the UFC uh, does boxing stuff too, but does all the UFC. He does everything. He's 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 probably the he's probably the best in the business, and um, he. I'm, I'm getting ready to leave because Max and Stephen A, everybody, we, we had done our stuff and the car, w- the car was waiting for us. We're getting ready to leave. Okay, see you later. I'm walking out with them. All of a sudden, oh, Teddy, you got to stay. <laughs> uh, really? <laughs> yeah, you got to stay. You got to do a few more hits. And um, I stayed and stayed pretty late. And again, I enjoyed because I was with good people. I was with intelligent people. Uh, and I was with genuine people. So, uh, and and I appreciated that they wanted me, uh, you know, to to, you know, to give my two cents uh, on on the things. But anyway, let's get to the fight and everything because uh, it was it, it really was there was drama, obviously, and leading up to yeah. it. Yeah, lots of drama. And before we do, I just want to tell you a couple of people that I forgot to tell you. They said hello. If you remember when we were at NASCAR race uh, two years ago, we bumped into Machine Gun Kelly and I saw him at the um, Dave Chappelle show. And thanks to Dave Chappelle for all the awesome hospitality. And he said, tell Teddy I said hello. And then uh, Action Bronson, the uh, rapper, came up and he started doing bang, bang. And I was like, who the hell is this guy? And he's like, hey, man, I lost like 50 pounds um, boxing. And tell Teddy, I said, thanks. I watch every episode you guys do and it's huge motivation. And I love listening to Teddy's life lessons. It was unbelievable. You know, it's uh, a real real blessing that that we can – we can hear these things, and I can hear them from you. That, that it was the people you know, couldn't have been nicer. Like big, top like celebrities were like just couldn't have been nicer. Dave Chappelle and I was with my friend Ben Anderson who made the intro, and then Dave invited us over to his hotel. We had IVs the next day because we were all hungover. It was just awesome, and all the people were like, "Oh, tell Teddy this, tell Teddy that." Every every single person. So nice meeting everyone. It was awesome. Let's talk about the fight. The arena was on fire. Uh, your man DJ Trump walked in. The place went crazy. They almost blew the roof off. And uh, you know, you you, I, I was curious how the crowd would react. It was probably a little bit, maybe sixty forty cheers, but it was it, it was loud. I mean, you know, like like a fight broke out in the crowd. Everyone's standing up looking, and I'm like, oh my god, it's Trump. So anyway, Trump was there. All the dignitaries. I mean, it was a who's who. It was celebrity central. I think it was one of the highest demands for tickets ever. The UFC said the floor seats were going for over ten thousand dollars. It was crazy. Um, I gotta say, I was quite surprised at how one sided the crowd was for Conor McGregor, which was surprising and and I, I gotta say a little bit disappointing. Obviously, we love Dustin, but I mean, it's an American fighter fighting an Irish guy. You know, one guy's playing the villain, the other guy's a good family guy, and the crowd's going crazy for the villain. I, it was just, and anyway, um, incredible reaction to everything. The fight starts out, obviously, Connor comes out gunning, kicking, spinning kicks, everything, which is kind of what I think I expected. And from what I, speaking with Dustin after the fight, what he was expecting. And um, Dustin weathered the storm, takes it to the ground, grounds and pounds him, and just beats him up for the last two and a half ish minutes. 
and just really puts it on him. Two of the three judges had it 10-8. Um, obviously then Connor steps back, breaks his ankle and you know, the Connor fans, man, they were upset. They were like, it wasn't a good win, blah, blah, blah. And I say, what gave you any indication based on the last three minutes of that first round that Connor was going to get better as the fight went on? To me, it was inevitable. Dustin had full control, beat the crap out of him. And uh, unfortunately, he broke his leg and it was unsatisfactory, but shocking to me the way Connor acted after the fight. I thought he would say, hey, congratulations to Dustin. Good fight, unfortunate incident the way it ended, but let's do it again. He didn't do that. He talked really negatively, said some awful things, talked about his wife. Just, Teddy, the worst sportsmanship I've ever seen in combat sports. Just poor, poor, poor sportsmanship. Dustin kept it classy. He said, look, I don't wish any ill will on anyone. Hope he gets home safe to his family. I don't care that he wished death on me before the fight. It is what it is. Tell me what you saw in the fight because I'm dying to hear your reaction. We haven't had a chance to speak about anything since we got back from uh, Vegas. So yeah. give it to me. Yeah, no. Uh, yeah, sure. I saw that. Listen. Uh, Dustin, it bothered Dustin, you know, and Dustin was a gentleman about it, but it bothered him because he said the right thing. As you said, he said, listen, this guy saying these things, I hope he gets back to his family uh, safely after what we've been through. That That's that's what a good human being thinks. But, you know, he, he was, I mean, it was bothered by it because Dustin, you know, Dustin caught him a dirt bag afterwards. And, and you wouldn't say that if you weren't affected by it. So Dustin, obviously, we're talking about being sensitive. If you're a decent human being, those things are going to be sensitive to you. Otherwise, you know, you don't care about those things otherwise. And if you do care about them, then you're going to be impacted to a certain degree. Not before the fight because you're too professional about it. But obviously... Uh, to say, you know, afterwards, he obviously he was disgusted by hearing those things, and he made a point of it, which rightfully so. You know, Dustin said, "How do you go and say what he did it at the uh, at the weigh in where they, you know, had the promotional weigh in with all the the place was packed for the weigh in was on." It was yeah, I was there. It was like a sold out crowd to watch a ceremonial weigh in. Yeah, and and then of course, you know, everyone says something. They got to stare down all that stuff. But then he goes and says, "I'm going to kill you. I'm going to put you in a coffin. I'm going to put you in a bar. whatever." And and he's going to end. Up, he's going to have to leave in a stretcher, it's, yeah, which is yeah. funny that and, that it was the other yeah, way around. Right. That's why you got to sometimes be careful with you. You know, what'd you say? But listen, it was ironic that he left on the stretcher, no doubt about it. But, you know, like it did bother Dustin afterwards. He said, how do you say a thing like that? This is a dangerous sport to begin with. How do you say that? I'm going to kill you. You're going to, you know, you you shouldn't be saying those things. Look, there's a realm of behavior. I've always said it on ESPN doing the fights for so many years. You have to fight like a fighter. But then you have to behave like a fighter. You have to fight like a champion. But then you have to behave like a champion. They go hand in hand. And obviously, he fought like a warrior, you know, Connor. Uh, he went out there. He was better than the last time. His energy level was higher. You know, he tried to mix it up, as you made a good point, with the kicks. He, You know, he took a different approach. Um, and, and he was better prepared, mentally at least. Uh, and and it uh, you know and you can see that he was, but of course Poirier was prepared uh, you know and Poirier is right now he's just a more rounded fighter than him he is whether you like it or not I'm not knocking your man I'm just saying he's a more complete fighter he's a more rounded solid fighter in in all the dimensions of MMA right now I mean he is so anyway uh, and he's not that guy that he was seven years ago he's not that kid that you could slap around you know he's not that kid that. That these kind of uh, that kind of noise that Connor Briggs that he lives off of, uh, that it affected him back then, but it doesn't affect him now. It affected him seven years ago. Uh, doesn't it be the first one to tell you that? But in a know, way, it's almost made him stronger, Teddy. That he showed that, like, listen, that's just of noise. It. Focus on your but, yeah, craft. He learned. He's, he's, he learned. He's much better now. No, uh, you're right. It's all part of the metamorphosis. It's all part of the development, all part of the journey, all part of the development as a human being, as a fighter, as whatever you are. Yeah, you know, you could be a lawyer and you get thrown off by what the judge tells you or what the DA said in the middle of your case because you were young and you get thrown off and you forget about what your argument was going to be. And then what, five years later, you've been through those things and you and those things don't bother you. Why? Because you matured, because you went through it, because sometimes you got to lose to win. That's the way it is. And, and, you, and you learn these things and you develop as a human being, as a professional, whatever it is that you do, you know. But 
and obviously that's what's happened with Poirier. He's developed into a whole different kind of animal, if you want. Uh, at, at Teddy, this point. the one thing the one thing I want to mention during the uh, about the trash talk, and Rob just reminded me is if you remember, Israel Adesanya said with regards to trash talk, there's certain areas you just don't go into. Family, 100%. religion. Connor crossed every crossed every line. He, he's gonna kill him. He's talk about his wife. It, it was just bad form. Listen again. I'll just keep it simple. You fight like a fighter. You fight like a champion. That's what you, that's what you're you're looking to do. That that is your goal, and part of that has to be you behave like a champion. You f- behave like a fighter, and you behave uh, that that has to be connected. Uh, they go hand in hand. You know, I remember years ago with the Nike commercials and Charles Barkley, who I love, I love him, yeah, because he's honest, and I do. I really he makes a stand. He's not afraid to make a stand. He said, "Listen, when they were talking about your role model, how you be," he said, "I'm not a role model," and and I get it. But you know what? Then that went down a certain road because whether you like it or not. You, you I, I'll use a different term. Instead of calling you a role model, you're, you're an example. You're out there. You're a leader, uh, whether you like it or not. And people are influenced. Younger people are influenced. They are looking at what you do. It is important how you behave. It is important. You know, it's, it's, it's important just, you know, as people. And he, you know, he failed in that way. And, and I'll go a little deeper real quick. Um... See, to be great, you have to have longevity. Yeah, listen, Connor's been a meteor, and I'm not saying he's not great and all that stuff, but he's been a meteorite. To be to be great, you got to be Joe Lewis, 21 years, 20 years, whatever. Muhammad Ali, same thing. All, all these guys, Tom Brady, uh, Michael Jordan. It, there's longevity involved. It is. I don't care what you say. I'll argue you to 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 the end of the to the end of the day. Um, there has to be longevity. And what is involved in longevity? Well. I'll tell you, of course, it's resiliency. Um, Dustin has gotten a PhD in resiliency and overcoming things, uh, stuff like that. But what is it that allows you for greatness to have the longevity to fall into that category? It's, It's substance. It's substance. What gets you to the door? Talent talent and of course mental toughness and you know all those things and drive and will but talent will get you to the door but to get through that door that great door that big door that big oak door to get through that the longevity comes from the substance meteorites are are different than planets the guys that get there are planets What do I mean by that? They have soil, they have rock, they have substance. And I'm going to use a word that's going to upset some people. Character. Character. And listen, I'm not saying that, I'm not saying that Connor doesn't have character. I'm not saying that. But what I'm saying is, to what degree? Because the character is that earth. It is that rock. It is what constitutes the planet. It is what separates the planet from the meteor. It is. I know it. I've been in this business my whole life. I've seen it. I know it. There's a reason why certain guys last longer than other guys. And that's, yeah, genetics and yeah, how many punches you took and your style. Yes, yes, I'm with you. You don't have to teach me on that. I, 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 I tell you. I'll, I'll say it before you say it, but character. And it speaks to that a little bit that, you know, we'll see. Maybe he'll wind up having a longevity. He hasn't had it yet. Connor hasn't had it yet. Not yet. And listen, his injury is another thing that's going to impact that. But, you know, some of the great ones, whether it was Brady with the knee injury, whether it was whoever, they come back. They come back. And maybe Connor will. And he probably will. But I just wanted to say that and for people to understand that those dimensions are dimensions. They are. They're part of this. They're part of it in life of success, of true success to that next level. So that that longevity that I'm talking about. Uh, at the end of the day, he went into a realm he shouldn't have went into. Uh, again, you know, and listen, I... I I think that 
there's a promotional side. I'm not making no excuses for him, but I am going to give him the benefit of there's a promotional side. He's the notorious one. He's got that, he's got that, you know, he's got that trademark, right? He's got that brand, right? He sells that brand. So he was he was trying to be consistent in that area. He was trying to make sure that he did what he had to do in that area, you know. But again, there's places you don't have to go. There's places, even with that notorious stuff, there's places you don't go, whether it's with the killing a guy, whether it's with the wife, the family. You don't have to go to those places. And, um, and I always understand the moment, the heat of the moment, where, you know, he's laying on the floor with a, with a freaking a, a broken, you know, whatever bone it was. Tibia. Um, Tivia. Uh, he's laying on the floor with that and, and he's got the motion running, coursing through his veins of, of just being involved in a fight. Most people out there never will experience that. They never understand that that adrenaline rush and, and, and what that can do to you mentally and emotionally and what that can, what that can lead you to being more prone to saying uh, where you normally might not say it if you were in a different atmosphere. I, that's part of it too. I get it. But still, these guys are trained to have their wits about them in chaos, in fire, in the most difficult situations, in an uncomfortable environment. They're trained to be able to think better than a normal person. So you, you, have, to, you have to think better and you have to draw those lines, those parameters. Um, Having said that, I the noise came back. That was the big difference in his fight, you know, with all that stuff. He brought the noise. The last time they were buddy-buddy, uh, the, the last fight when Poirier won, they were buddy-buddy. And you know what? Buddy-buddy don't work for Connor. You know, quiet is his enemy. And I think, I think that there's truth to that. Quiet is his enemy. He lives off chaos. He lives off madness. He lives off, you know, stuff that other people uh, get overcome by. It, it, it lifts him. Like helium will lift a balloon. You know, he's, I mean, that noise, I mean, it's like the ocean with the crashing waves. You know, it wouldn't be an ocean without crashing waves. It would be what? A lake. And and that's kind of that's kind of Connor, you know, with without the crashing waves, he's just a lake, and in, he needs to be the ocean, and he tried to bring, he tried to do that. I, there's no doubt about it. I don't think it was an accident. I, I think it was planned that that he brought, that he had to find something to be angry about. Anger with a purpose, not madness, but anger with a purpose. Madness with the atmosphere, but with the hope that that atmosphere will do damage to his opponent. That, because, again, he, he thrives in that atmosphere. You know, that, he breathes that air, you know, where somebody else gets, you know, gets exhausted by that air, gets taken out by that air. Not him. He lives in that air. And the last time that air wasn't there, last time it was, it was too quiet. So he tried to do everything, and I think that was part of it. Uh, bringing that, bringing bringing that back, bringing that, that chaos, uh, commotion, bringing it back. And he did. And obviously what he forgot was that um, Poirier's got earplugs now. You know, he's, he's got the earplugs. And you know how he got them? He, uh, it was expensive. He got them through that first fight. Yeah, it was expensive. It's called experience. And he went through the experience of what that noise can do to you if you let it do it to you. And he learned from that. And so he wasn't getting to Poirier with this noise this time, you know. And in some ways, in some ways, he was telling Poirier, he didn't realize this, but I'm sure Poirier did. In some ways, he was saying to Poirier, I'm desperate. I'm desperate. I had to bring this, this old friend of craziness, I had to invite him back because I didn't think I could beat you without him. And so it, it's very interesting. I always say that fights take place on a couple stages. The first stage is the psychological stage, the where you have to stare down, you, you have to get 
throw that. You, you know, the, then you have the waiting in the dressing room where the ninjas of doubt can come over that wall so fast. The ninjas of negative imagination can come storming in on you. You have to deal with that, the psychological part of it. And then, of course, you have to go and execute the physical, the technical part of it. And Poirier was ready for all of it. He was ready for all of it. See, I, I see it deeper uh, maybe than some people, but hopefully that's what I'm supposed to explain to people on this show, why we do this show. Because this is, this is the business that I'm in. If you don't understand that, you know, the X's and O's, if I only understand the X's and O's as a trainer and the physical, technical parts, I'd never be a decent trainer. Because those X's and O's only mean something if you can apply them. If you can apply them. If you, if you can do them under pressure. If you can do them in an environment that exists in this business. You have to understand that environment. You have to understand what that environment does to a human being. You have to understand that. If you just understand, well, when you throw a jab, you turn it over clockwise, you have your chin into your shoulder, move after your last punch. Yeah, yeah, I understand all that. But you have to understand more than that. You have to understand the human part, the mental part. What were you going to say, Ken? I'm sorry. Uh, two things. The first thing is there's a great example of just what you're talking about in the documentary I th w w about Mike Tyson called Look at Us Now or Wait Till They See Us where Mike is about to fight in an amateur tournament and he's outside and you're talking to him and he's crying and you're like, hey, relax. It's just like in the gym or whatever you told him. But that's a perfect example of the ninjas are getting him and he's so emotional. He's breaking down before he goes in there and slaughters the guy. But you talk to them, it, I don't even, I can't even believe they have this footage. The guy had to be right on top of you. So they've got Mike Tyson's outside in his robe, ready to go crying, nervous about the fight. And you're telling him, hey, this is what we do. This is what we train for. And he goes in and slaughters the guy. That's the first thing I wanted to say, we highlight what you're talking about. But the other thing is, I thought that Connor's antics at the, at the press conference and saying, I'm going to kill you. You're going to pay with your life. It was so over the top that it almost, to your point, seemed like desperation to me. I said, I was talking to Dustin. I said, I think, I, I know no one's scared, but I feel like he's super nervous. And this is his way he's masking that by telling you yeah. what he's. I think it was, he was basically without meaning to. He was telling you that, hey, I need help. I'm desperate. Yes. I can't do this alone. I got to bring this element into it. And by the way, the documentary you're talking about with Tyson when he was young was uh, called Watch Me Now. Um, by Michael yeah, Martin. fantastic. I can't believe the footage they have of you and him when he's young. It's, it's unbelievable. Hey, guys, just a quick pause to give a thank you to today's sponsor, Athletic Greens, the all-in-one daily drink to support better health and peak performance. I know I sound like a broken record when I say this stuff, but I take it with me everywhere, just back from the fights in Vegas. And uh, as you do in Vegas, uh, there were a lot of late nights. First thing I do in the morning is take Athletic Greens. Gets me back on track. These guys spent 10 years with top nutritionists and doctors to create this formula. It's made from 75 whole food sourced ingredients. It's got vitamins, minerals, prebiotics, probiotics, and antioxidants. Like I said before, consider it an insurance policy for your body's immune system, especially during COVID times. Wear your mask, take your athletic greens, it goes without saying. This is all you need to stay on top of your immunity with 12 servings of fruits and vegetables. No need for multivitamins or whatever else you might be taking. Athletic Greens has you covered. Uh, as a special office offer to our listeners, you get 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. This to me is invaluable because like I said, I take these things with me everywhere. So whether you're looking to boost your energy levels, support your immune system, or address gut health, Athletic Greens is the way to go. Simply visit athleticgreens.com slash atlas to claim the special offer of 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. Again, that's athleticgreens.com slash atlas, A-T-L-A-S, to take advantage of the opportunity. Guys, also want to take a minute to plug Teddy's audio book. Uh, this thing is awesome if you haven't heard it before. It's called Atlas, From the Streets to the Ring, A Son's Struggle to Become a Man. It's not just about boxing, but about life lessons. And as you know, Teddy is the guru of life lessons. It's an awesome book. I listened to it several times while I'm running. Uh, check it out at audible.com or order it on iTunes. There's a link below in the show notes to get the book for free with your first use of audible.com. Again, it's called Atlas, From the Streets to the Ring, A Son's Struggle to Become a Man. 
But again, I always say that a fight in my business and in, I believe in MMA the same, that it's about geography. Who owns, who buys the real estate, if you will? Because you got to buy it. You don't buy it with, obviously, with currency, with money, but there's different forms of currency. You, you buy it with risk. You buy it with skill. You buy it with will. Um, and you buy it with intellect. But you buy it. You buy that real estate. And whoever buys the real estate that makes the most sense for their abilities, that suits their abilities to the utmost, usually is going to win a fight. And so that's what I was watching right at the beginning. Who's going to get to geography? And who needs what geography? Well, it was pretty, you don't need Teddy Atlas to tell you that. I mean, Dustin needed, well, I'll start with, I'll start with, uh, I'll start with Connor. Connor needs the outside real estate. He, people forget, when he was soaring across the sky like a meteorite, like I said earlier, he was kind of punching the crap out of people. I mean, that's what he was. Brilliant counter punches, southpaw, gave him a little edge and a good punch with the left hand. He And, and good instincts and a lot of confidence and very calm in an uncalm place. He, he was... He was a counter punch. He, people started to think because he's the notorious one and he was knocking guys out that he was a sick and destroy missile. He it was never that. Matter of fact, when he when he came forward, you had a chance to catch him. You had a chance to catch him, and that's how Poirier caught him uh, in the second fight. He came a little too close. He got caught with a counter left hand, and then he followed up and he knocked him out. And so the geography that had to be if you're going to win a fight for Connor was to be on the outside to be that counter puncher, to give room to Poirier to make mistakes, to hope that he did make mistakes, that he would reach in where you get a chance to counter. He's got long arms. There's a reason why Connor was winning after four rounds against Mayweather in that, you know, in that giant, giant money event, uh, you know, spectacle, whatever you want to call it. But it was a fight. It was, it was a fight, a real fight. And Floyd had to go get him. Uh, and he did. But after, and the reason he had to go get him was he realized after four rounds he was behind because, you know, Floyd's a counter puncher. He was waiting for something to be given him to counter. And then all of a sudden his southpaw with long arms wasn't giving him nothing to counter. He was keeping him at the end of the jab. So he had to go get him. He was winning the fight because he had those long arms and he had the ability to use them in, in that kind of way. And that's what he needed to do with Poirier. He needed to use that reach. He needed to keep the range where he could set up what he was best at, trying to take advantage of someone else's mistakes. And on the other side, the geography that Poirier needed, he needed to be close. He needed to be in the trenches. He's got short arms from the striking standpoint, so he's got to be at a certain range to land, number one. And I said it earlier, he's, he's better on the mat than, than most guys, but definitely better than Connor. I mean, he's a black belt in jujitsu. He's a great grappler. I mean, he's better on the mat. So either way, it serves Poirier to be close, either to strike or to get him on the mat uh, into his territory where he's better. And the guy that was getting the territory, you know, the guy that was getting the geography Right, really, right from the outside, pretty much. It took a little while to get into it, but it was Poirier. He got the geography that he needed, and that's why he was doing what he was doing. That's why he got a ten eight round. Now I'll tell you yep. something interesting. I was working with my old colleague Max Kellerman, my old colleague. And By the was, way, that I loved that segment of the two of you together. It was so great. I love seeing two boxing guys breaking it down, breaking down MMA. It was fantastic. Well, I appreciate it. I, listen, he's my old colleague, my old friend, and my old nemesis at the same time, uh, <laughs> you know, because I used to give him hell uh, on, <laughs> on, on Friday Night Fights. But and now he's got your other buddy beating him up every day, Stephen oh, A. Smith. Yeah, so <laughs> I yeah he got used to it. You know what I mean? I yeah. I I warmed him up. I I I softened him up. I got him used to taking punches, <laughs> um, a little bit. Um, got him used to what it's gonna feel like when you're in the when you're in the in that real ring of life of fighting of <laughs> all that stuff. Uh, it, yeah. They are gonna come at you. So. 
and Stephen A is great. And I, I also work with Stephen A. So I, yeah, I got I to work you. with two of my old friends. Um, and, and listen, I, I like working with Max. I enjoy working with Stephen A more. I know I'm not supposed to, but again, I, if I'm known for anything, I'm known for not always being a guy that minces my words and not always being a guy that's um, diplomatic and not always being, but being the way I feel. I say what I feel. I say what I feel. Uh, you, I still try to be a gentleman all the time. I love Max. I love Stephen A, but I enjoy being with Stephen A a little more. There's just something, and I enjoy Max, but I'm not going to lie. I'm going to be, as always, I'm going to say what I feel. I, I, there's something about the energy about being with Stephen. I just get a kick out of it. I just, it's like being, it's like being with your brother that, that you haven't seen for a long time, and when you used to be with him, uh, you guys used to give each each other uh, noogies on the head. You know what I mean? And and, 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 and and like the commercial with the Peyton brothers years ago, give each other like, well, what do they do? They're, they're putting a finger in the ear when he's not walking. <laughs> he's tapping him on the back. You know, I, it, it, it's just fun. I just, yeah. I just feel f that fun. And and um, and love too, to be quite frank. And, and listen, I feel great with Max, but it's just a different great. Um, yeah. But with Max... I got to say one thing, when, when we were breaking it down afterwards, we were, one thing that I really, when he was talking, and we, listen, he could disagree with me. And again, I'm, I'm, I'm saying what I, what I felt uh, right at that moment. I, I disagreed with his perspective where he was basically saying that Connor knew he couldn't win, which maybe is true, uh, because I made a point of that already. But that, and he was, so he went, he went for the takedown. He went for the guillotine, which was a big turning point of the game of the fight. It really was. It was a huge element of the fight. It, it, it was huge for me. And he went for that because he knew he couldn't win the fight. And and you know he couldn't win the fight maybe at all. But he, that was his only chance. He went for that. And I, and listen, here's where I disagree. I disagree in the fact that what led to it. What led to it, where Max, I guess, wasn't looking at, or in his, in his analysis, it, it wasn't thought through, where Max just said, oh, he went for the guillotine. He didn't just go for the guillotine. It was put in his lap. It was delivered to him. He got put in that position, not purposely. And, and I'll explain what I mean by that. The same thing that happened in the last fight happened here. And maybe not everyone saw it, but... Dustin is a really good puncher, and he's a really good striker. His feet are always under him, so he's always got leverage. He's he's always got good position to deliver a good, solid blow. Kind of like, in a way, the Japanese champion in boxing. You know, I, I've said that before, uh, where, in a way, is always in good position, always balanced to throw a good, deliver a good, solid shot. And Joe Lewis, the great Joe Lewis. I'm not comparing anyone to Joe Lewis. I'm not crazy, but... Joe Lewis, part of his greatest strength was his balance, his position, his feet. He was always in position to throw solid punches, never out of position, never off balance. So Dustin's always set. And Dustin, in the last fight, where he knocked him out in the, in the, you know, the prior fight, before the trilogy fight, Dustin caught, that's how he knocked him out. He caught McGregor getting too close. He threw from too close. He gave up his reach and he hurt him with a left hand. And then he followed up. And McGregor tried to just stay outside and act like he wasn't hurt. And he stayed outside. But what he didn't realize was all this experience, we talk about it all the time with the UFC fighters, why you can have seven losses, six losses, eight losses, and still be a champion because you learn from those losses. You go through the fire, you get forged by those losses. You become something from those losses. That's Poirier. Poirier, what I don't think that he realized was Poirier recognized immediately. He knew he hurt him, he felt it. And he knew that even if he acted like he wasn't hurt, he was hurt. So what did he do? Poirier followed up. And he had the opportunity to follow up because, you know, Connor was on the outside. He stayed there and he followed up and he, he just took him apart. And, and he was relentless and he finished him. 
That was in the mind of McGregor. He understood that going into this one. And what happened in that first round was he got caught again with a left hand, and he got hurt by Dustin. And Dustin was going to start to open up on him again. Poirier did something, not Poirier, uh, McGregor did something different this time, Ken. McGregor recognized that if he stayed outside of the range, the flow would have kept going. The faucet on the uh, the faucet would have kept running. The water would have kept running. He needed to turn the faucet off. He couldn't keep that water running because otherwise he's going to get knocked out again. So what did he do? He did what we do in boxing. He fell in and he clinched. Now I know there's a different term in 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 the MMA. Uh, I know it's you know it's going for the shoot. It's going for the takedown. It's going. But what he did was a boxing move. He went in for the clinch. He went into to. to to tie him up so he couldn't continue punching. And it did. It worked. It, it, it allowed him to survive that moment where otherwise he wouldn't have. And I don't know how many people saw that. And so that's where I disagree with Max because Max just said, oh, he just went for the... No, he got put into that position because what happened was once he went in for that, then there's a progression. There's different phases in MMA. The next progression was what? You're going to wind up going to the mat. Once somebody's got his hands on you, you go, someone's going to the mat. So they wound up going to the mat. Once they got to the mat, it kind of fell in his lap. That he got a, suddenly got a position, got an opportunity for the guillotine. He went for it. I'm not so sure he wanted to because he expended a lot of energy. And, and, and it, in some ways, it took the air out of the sails. And he still had a lot of ocean to sail. <laughs> he still had a long way to sail, four more, you know, four more rounds. So what happened was he was forced to go into the guillotine, whether he liked it or not. It was there. And he went to the guillotine. And what happened? Well, I'll tell you what happened. The brilliance of Dustin Poirier, of, of jiu-jitsu. He maneuvered. Oh, my God, it was brilliant. It was beautiful. I mean, yeah. uh, he was standing on his freaking head. <laughs> I mean, it was brilliant. He stood on his head, and he, he navigated out of it. He, he took the leverage away, the leverage of the, you know, the arm around the neck. Yeah. He took it away uh, from... from, from, um, uh, from obviously McGregor, and and he survived it. And then once he did, he got on top. He was on top. He stayed on top, and then he started pounding and ground and pound and just started to rain elbows and punches on him. And he, you know, he dominated. He, he I mean, he just dominated. Um, so that's where I disagree with Max so much. So come, because when he just said, oh, yeah, he just, you know, he just knew he couldn't win, so he went for, no. He got put into that position. There were things that happened that you should have noticed, that you must have missed, that happened uh, leading to that, that put him in that position where he had no choice but to go for the guillotine. So uh, that, that, was, that was the one thing that, you know, doing that piece with Max where I disagreed with that. Um, and listen, uh, after that, you know, when they got back to their feet, obviously and then they they got to the point where uh, again we have to talk about it it's part of what happened a horrendous injury you don't want anybody to get hurt like that horrendous i mean they're ugly uh, and and there's there's too many of them happening and uh, i'm not knocking the mma or ufc i it's a dangerous sport just like you can get hurt in my sport and people do get hurt i know it and there's fatalities. I know it sometimes. It's awful. It's tough. And we understand the risk. And we, you know, and we understand that. Um, and that's why it's so, well, it's why it's so noble and glorious what these guys do. You know, uh, these real life gladiators. What they do, take that risk and to go out there and put themselves into a realm where when they come out of that realm, there's less of themselves there. It's just a degree of how much less. There's always less. There's always less. It's just it's just like when the ocean comes up on the shore, Ken, and it goes back. There's a little less sand. There's a little less shore. You know, it just takes time to realize. You come back 10 years later, and you say, oh my God, there, there used to be a wide beach here. <laughs> uh, there used to be a wide, there's no beach here. There's like, there's, there's only five feet of beach width-wise. What happened? Same thing with fighters. Same thing with fighters. There's always, a, and that's why, 
That's why I always fight for them, and I always fought for them on ESPN the way I did and got in trouble sometimes, quite frankly, uh, for doing that. And that's why I always say that they deserve every cent they can make. Every cent they can make, they deserve because of the risk that they take. Every time they step inside that cage or inside that ring. But having said that, these these leg injuries, there's we've been seeing a lot of them. We saw it with Chris Wyman, obviously Anderson Silva a long time ago. Um, I mean, there's been so many of them, and and it's difficult to see them every time you see them. Um, I don't know what you could do. It's part of the inherent risk. You're using your legs. You're hitting somebody's bone on their leg. Um, you know, so I don't know. But I and I'm not. I'm not in any way purporting myself to be an expert medically or anything in any way. I'm just a fight guy. I'm a boxing guy that's been around a dangerous business for a long time, a difficult business for a long, but a glorious business with noble warriors. And I just, I wonder if there is anything. Could could you, without changing the whole landscape of it and the dynamic of it to a degree, I mean, we don't want headgear put on professional fighters that changes the sport. I get it. I understand. And it doesn't really protect them anyway, to be honest. The neurologist to tell you that, it doesn't really protect the brain. Uh, The best thing you can do is learn how to fight. Learn how to get away from the punches. Look out for your fighter. (laughs) You know, when it's time to to say the door, it's time to go through outside the door, then, then be that person that takes them outside the door out of that career when it's time to do that. Um, but while you're doing it, do it right. Look out for your fighter. You know, rest him in between. Make sure he's eating right. Make sure he's not making weight the wrong way. You know, make sure that make sure that he's not taking too many blows. Make sure that he's not over sparring and getting hit too much. Make sure you're teaching him right ways, avoiding punches to the greatest degree possible. You know, all that stuff. But I'm just wondering with all these leg breaks um, that are so difficult. If without changing the dynamic of the sport really too much, could you could you somehow fit some kind of some kind of cushion that fits close to the skin that you almost don't notice? You know, they come up with so many things, right? Uh, so many things out there athletically, you know, the ingenuity to these things from, from a science standpoint. I'm just wondering if they could come up with something that could be put on those vulnerable spots of the leg that you could wear that could cushion the bone a little bit, cushion the blow, absorb the blow, just a little bit. And again, I don't want headgear on the professional fighters. I, I get it. it doesn't help anyway. But if it helped, you have to think about it. But it doesn't help anyway. Uh, I get it. You don't want to change the nature, the dynamic. Some people still hate that there's a designated hitter brought into baseball. They hate it. They hate it. They say, oh, my God, what are you having a designated hitter? Uh, you're supposed to put pinch hitters in. You're supposed to bunt. You're supposed to figure out a way to manage the game. Not put a DH in. You change the game. You change the, you know, the, the whole tradition of the game. I get it. I get it. But I just wonder. I think you have to wonder about it when you see more of these injuries. If there is something you could put on the ankle area, the the bone area, the the fibula area, the, those areas, uh, if you just that maybe it helps to a thirty degree, thirty percent degree, twenty percent degree, ten percent degree. I don't know, but I I think it's something that somebody at some point is going to have to have for conversation about. Um, I know Rob's got it keyed. I want to look at, because obviously I the guillotine moment for me was a turning point, uh, was a big, big turning point of the, of, the, of the match. And another thing was obviously the leg kicks because Connor got destroyed by him in the last fight. Kind of got taken down by those leg kicks. Magnificent plan by Poirier. He he got destroyed by them. This time he came in saying, "I'm going to give some leg kicks," and he did. And and but it, it backfired on him in a in a way that he got injured. Now, um, we don't know. It's all speculation. 
We don't know for sure, so I'm the first one to put that out there. But we want to examine everything, and that's what we do on this show. And I want to bring up the part where he a leg kick is thrown by Connor, and Poirier checks it the way you're supposed to check a leg kick. He checks it. But then something happens because everyone's trying to guess where did it happen? Did, did it happen just on a step back where all of a sudden his ankle flopped? Or it was, t- again, disturbing to see. Where the ankle just flopped? Did it happen just on that? Was that enough force to create that? To make that bone break? Or did it happen with a prior kick where people were speculating? With a prior kick where it got a crack? Maybe, maybe a, you know, a... a a hairline crack, whatever, that it, it got a crack, and then later on when he stepped back, that was enough to bring it to that, to that stage. So if we're going to talk about that, and we are, because everyone else is, we're going to look at this, where there's a check by Poirier, a kick by Connor, a check by Poirier, and then something very interesting, Ken, and I know you know it, uh, Poirier points, Really interesting. In the middle of, of fighting, he points. He points down to the leg of Connor. Almost as if he felt something and he's saying to Connor, You just broke your ankle. Let's see, let's see it. Yeah. There's the point. See, we there there's, is there. there's the point. There's the point. Now we're gonna see, of course, the kick, and we're gonna see it in full motion, you know. Uh, and here it comes. So here comes the kick. You're going to get the kick, and then you're going to get the the whole sequence of everything, hopefully. We could even run it at regular time would be fine. We don't probably need slow. But you yeah, saw no, the... I, I, I think they just have the stills because yeah, no, the that's UFC fine. hasn't released well, the actual yeah. footage. But there's well, the stills of the kick job. in the knee. Yeah, tremendous. There yeah. it is. And there's now, the he kick just threw knee, that kick, and, then and there's it. the point. Yeah. Now, right now, Ken, Poirier, to me... And we're going to interview him, so we're going to ask him directly. And I ask him that question. We're, we're going to have him on. But that, to me, he's pointing to the leg like he's saying, you just broke your leg. <laughs> you know, like he's saying, because it's all a psychological battle too. But to the point that I'm, I really feel that he, that that's what he was saying, and we'll confirm it with him when we talk to him. But to that point is that, he said after the fight that he felt something. Poirier said, he said, I felt something. I thought I felt something. Like, like I just felt something. I felt a noise. I heard something. But I felt that I, when he hit me with that kick and I check, checked it, I felt something. So, so yeah. nobody would know better than a combatant. I think he even said he heard something, like something like pop or crack, something like that. Yeah, and and nobody knows better than the people doing it, obviously. So of course, yeah. And any points. So for me, right there, right there was obviously something that was going to tell the whole fight. We didn't know it, we didn't know it, mm. but yeah. right there was you know was obviously was writing on the wall of what the end of this fight was going to be. And when he pointed again, he heard something, he felt something. He's basically for me, he's saying, "You just hurt yourself." You just cracked your leg. Yeah. yeah. You just cracked your leg. And he's getting into his head, obviously trying to. And and then, of course, later on, he steps back in the, you know, that terrible, terrible scene. And we've seen it before. We've seen it in football. We've seen it years ago with Joe Theismann. We've seen it with uh, with some other guys. It's it's horrible. Uh, you know, and it's, it's what are you going to, I mean, it's, it's a difficult, uh, tough sport. And sometimes that's the risk. But, um, I, I, I don't, for the people out there, and again, it's speculation, but for the people, we do that, but we do it in a responsible way. We do it in a way that we're putting forward experience with, with our speculation, you know, with our judgments. Um, it's, it's uh, you know, it, it's a calculated uh, guess, you know, it's, it's an informed guess, uh, not just a just saying something just to say it um what would have happened if that didn't happen because that's what it's going to lead to it's going to lead to if there's a rematch you know if he recovers from this uh and then listen it's not a guarantee that at 32 years of age 
and hundreds of millions of dollars later. Look, that's part of it. You know, he made 120 million with Heapy and Connor. He made 120 million with with Floyd or whatever he made. Uh, from what I understand, he's made a at least somewhere around 200 million so far with this whiskey that he's doing proper proper two to 300 million for 100 percent. that that's true i spoke to one of the guys who knows the deal really well and they, they allegedly they got 300 million each him and his partner who started and, and it's only going to go higher so i mean so he's got that so i can even add that you know 300 million with 120 million that's a lot of money and and so he's you got all that and now you got this kind of horrific injury, do you want to come back? See, people say, can he come back? Will he come back? He's coming back. Do you want to come back? That's number one. He's got to, well, I know the pride and everything else, but do you want to come back? Do you want to go through the rehab and everything else and everything that could happen again? You know, he got surgery. From what I understand, they put a, a rod. I guess that's the way they do it, obviously. They put a rod into that area. Um, so he got the surgery. He went through the surgery, from what I understand. I asked a few people. They said everything went, you know, well. He posted something on social media saying that he was uh, out of surgery and all went well. Oh, good. And one quick thing. Dustin said on our show the last time we interviewed him that he was expecting more um, – more leg kicks this uh, camp, and that he had been working on exactly that is defending the leg kicks and checking them. And, and we and Rob sent, I think, a tweet highlighting that as part of our uh, from one of our old interviews. Yeah, I mean, yeah. Listen, so does he want to come back? Can he come back? Uh, can he? It's not an automatic that you can come back to the level that you want to come. See, that's another thing. Yeah, you could come back, but to what level? Can he come back to the level that he needs to come back? Will he ever be at that level again? I don't know. Right now, he's not. Right now, again, I, I don't want to get you riled up, you uh, you notorious ones. Um, you know, but uh, he's not at the level of Oliveira. He's not at the level of Poirier. It's, it's in front of you right now. Right now. I mean, listen, things, he's dynamic with his talent. Um, maybe it'll change. He could catch somebody, he could hurt somebody. But right now, it doesn't look like he's quite at that echelon, at quite that level of, you know, with these other guys. Um, can he now offer this injury, come back? And again, it's not just come back. Come back and be at that level because that's where Connor's going. He ain't going, you know, he's, he's not going to some other level. He's, he's going to the top of the mountain. That's the only place that exists for him. So can he come back? Does he belong at the top of the mountain anymore? Uh, that's a question that's got to be asked. It's got to be asked. I'm sorry. But, um, you know, and, and I don't count him out. I don't count out a kid that came from the ghettos of Ireland the way he did and overcame all the things that he's overcome. I don't count him out. No. I'd be stupid to count him out. Never. But I'm just, I, I, I'm, I'm using my experience. I'm being honest here. I'm, I'm, I'm just going down the road I have to go down to put out the proper thoughts about the proper possibilities. And for him to come back, first of all, he's got to want to come back. He's with, you know, uh, after all that money, like Marvin Hagler, the great late Marvin Hagler, like he said, one of the greatest middleweights, greatest southpaws of all time in boxing. Like he said, you know, it's pretty freaking hard to get up and do road work at five in the morning when you've been sleeping in freaking silk sheets. Yeah, 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 it is. It is. And listen, I give Conor credit. He got up for this fight. There's no excuses there. There's no, he wouldn't make, he would never. He was ready. He got psychologically, mentally, emotionally, he brought the noise. He went, he went where he had to go in his mind. He was ready for this fight. And what happened, happened. And it's unfortunate that it ended that way. It's unfortunate. And listen, it plays into the, it plays into the comeback, uh, into the rematch thing. Because there'll be people out there that love them that this will fall right into their lap as an excuse. And maybe it is an excuse. Maybe it's, maybe, maybe it's not an excuse. Maybe it's the truth. But it'll fall right into their lap to be brought in. Oh, he, he would have been, uh, he would have got up and done something, you know, if, if, he, if his leg didn't get broke. So it kind of, it kind of, it's kind of, a, in some ways, what a promoter almost wants if, if he wants another fight. Really, it happens in boxing where it ends a certain way where now, now there's an ability to build a fourth fight. Oh, if he didn't break his leg, you know, he was, he, he, he was going to come do this and do that. And, he, you know, he survived what he had to, but, you know, he was going to go. 
all right, because now, now, now the, the door is open to go down that, that hallway if you want. If you want, and promoters always want to go down that whole way, Ken. Always, always. <laughs> if if they can make money, if they can sell the fight, for sure. Yeah, always. So listen, it comes down to will there be, and being that he's the money man still in the game, you could guess that there probably will be a fourth fight or somebody will want it because he's still iconic. He's still the money guy. He's still the name, you know. He's kind of like when Tyson lost, he still got the big money. Why? Because because you never know what the drama that he brought. He might bite someone's freaking head off, you know, in the middle of a fight. He's still getting it at fifty two. He's still getting it at fifty two years old. People still paying to see him fight. I mean, you know, because of because of that, you know, because of that that just that curiosity morbid curiosity maybe some ways but whatever you know what what what's he gonna do he bit a man's ear off once yeah really yeah you didn't hear about that yeah he bit a guy's <laughs> ear off and then he sat down and he, he watched it down with a martini really <laughs> really yeah and, and then he ate the olives rick come on and he ate the olives that's the most disgusting part of this story <laughs> that, that that he swallowed the olive after the ear and the martini, I mean, you never know where, you know, these stories go. They, they go on a life of their own, you know. And, and people that have that kind of mystique uh, that Tyson had. And then there's the other ones, too, that just bring the kind of fight they bring. Like Arturo Gatti, God bless him, the late, great Arturo Gatti, where he just made such great fights that people didn't care if he lost. They knew the drama they were going to get. They knew the theater they were going to be involved in. They, they knew what he was bringing. You know, so Connor brings a lot of things that win or lose, people still want to see him. And um, so there's a good chance being that he's still the, you know, he's still the cash cow in that business that there, there, there'll be a demand for a fourth fight if he, again, number one, does he want to come back? I know everyone guess. Of course he does. That is pride. Bob, does he want to? You know, he's he's got. A, he don't only have silk sheets. He's got silk pajamas, silk pillows, you know, silk slippers. <laughs> you know, with that kind of money, you you got a lot of silk. You can buy a lot of silk. A lot of silk. I mean, not as. I mean, you know about that, Ken. I mean, you got you got. Uh, <laughs> I mean, it's it's a new material they're just working on. That's uh, <laughs> not even out there yet. That some of your people are working on that's better than so <laughs> that 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 you have but at the end of the day does he want to can he recover properly from the injury it's not it's not an easy injury you know can he recover properly from it and number three can he ever be at that level that he once was at uh you know we don't know that we don't know that but I think that that's a pretty good synopsis of the fight. Um, uh, again, Poirier, Poirier was, at the end of the day, he's the more rounded guy. He's the more dimensional guy. He's the more versatile guy. He is. I mean, taking nothing away from Connor. Connor's tremendous. But Poirier is, and again, it served him to have those losses in his career, to have those six, seven. Well, how many losses does Poirier have? What's his record? Uh, give me one second. I'm not sure the exact record, but I'll tell you while you talk. All right, well, listen, it it served him because it formed him into a solid guy in, in all dimensions. It formed him into a solid psychological guy, psychologically, formed mentally tough, a resilient guy. A, a 28 guy, and 6. See, 6 laws. A guy that's seen everything, a guy who's been in with all kinds of styles, guy who's experienced and overcome everything it served him it served him and it served him now at this point in his life where he's just a real solid and i tell you the next fight for him is supposed to be the title fight and i and i'll talk to him when we interview him about this but i think and i'll bring it up to him but i think that from just knowing that he's gone through he being poirier Two difficult back-to-back camps, Ken. Um, physically difficult and emotionally difficult. Draining. Two back-to-back emotional camps. And, of course, you know, physical camps. That 
I think he needs a little time go, uh, go before he fights for the title. That, oh, Oliver is ready to go like tomorrow. You know, he's he, <laughs> he hasn't been through that. I, really. Yep. But but I think right, right. I think Dustin needs a little time. And and um but anyway, we'll see what happens with that, but that should be the next fight for the title and it's going to be a hell of a fight. It's going to be a hell of a fight. And in some ways it'll be a more dangerous difficult fight really than than the Connor fight because Oliveira in some ways is like looking in the mirror if you're yeah. Dustin it's like looking in the freaking mirror because He's they're both really well they're rounded. both well rounded they I mean they're both really good on the mat they're both really good strikers they're both really experienced they're both really tough they're both really confident um they're both really dynamic uh, it's like looking in the mirror that that's gonna be, that, that that's gonna be a hell of a freaking fight. Um, it really will be. Um, you know, I know it doesn't have the 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 bells and whistles and the you know uh, or the lights hitting the sky and everything to come <laughs> for the, the carnival stuff. Uh, I know it doesn't have what Connor brings in those kind of forms um, that the iconic ones bring. That the you know that those kind of superstars bring that have gotten to that place that have that kind of mistake and everything going on that Connor has um but as far as just a great fight it it, it figures to be it figures to be a hell of a fight possibly at the time when it does happen it could be a fight of the year you could you could you could say that ahead of time with a fight like that that it's got that kind of uh potential yeah it was uh it was quite the scene after the fight we went back to uh, my friend jesse itzler was there and i wanted to meet um dustin we went back to the house with dustin afterwards and went with him to his after party and it was just fantastic to see dustin walk through the casino and the place erupt and everybody cheering and chanting his name taking pictures with him it was really really nice to see him get the recognition the fans just absolutely loved him and uh I was super happy for him. He was there with uh, Thiago Alves, who just won the Bare Knuckles title. Uh, Mikey Brown, his whole camp, his manager, obviously his wife. Just a, He's got a good group of people around him, not surprisingly. And um, Theo Vaughn, the comedian who's also from Louisiana, was there. It was... Uh, quite the uh quite the crowd and we had we had a ton of fun after the fight and it was just so much fun to see and so nice to see dustin relaxing having fun enjoying himself and uh kind of basking in the glory for a few minutes after the fight um who got a bigger chair going through the casino that's what i want you or dustin probably 50 50 that's what i thought that's that's probably what i thought <laughs> I'm, I'm surprised it was that even Surprise! I think, was that uh, I think a, a couple people actually almost knocked me down trying to get past me to get a uh, selfie with Dustin, but it's all good. Um, hey, one of the things that I wanted to touch on, if if you unless you've got anything else with the UFC, is uh, I think they're starting to call you uh, Teddy Scoop Atlas now. You broke some big news in the boxing world on um, the uh, one of the top handicapping shows out there, Bill Krakenberger's podcast. You broke the news that uh, Tyson Fury had COVID, and that fight is now being postponed. It was supposed to be in two weeks on the 24th of July. Unfortunately, pushed back to, I think, September. But... Um, I'm dying to know how you got the scoop. You're like the CIA. Yeah, where, where did it? Go? Where did it, they break uh, it on? TM? T, 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 well, TMZ. Rep you broke it on Bill Krakenberger's podcast. No, no, but I, TMZ. I TMC was Who the first up, mainstream media source to pick up on your uh, scoop, and you know they've uh, gave you full credit. And uh, but TMC reported, it and they're very much uh, mainstream. But it just shows you what a big deal heavyweight fighting is when TMZ is reporting on it. Yeah, I can't divulge my sources, you know. I, I can't, <laughs> Shocking. Can't, I got different sources. <laughs> I got marinara sauce. I got vodka sauce. I got uh, <laughs> I, I got uh, tortellini sauce, uh, Alfredo, Alfredo sauce. Um, You're the opposite of my kids when they tattletale on each other. I always say to them, remind me not to rob a bank with you. Yeah, really. What do you mean, Dad? I go, because you're going to be telling on us both. Well, if you want to rob a bank, Teddy's your guy if you want someone who can keep his mouth shut. Can't give up my sources, but um, <laughs> but I I will have spaghetti with them later. I <laughs> Listen, uh, yeah, I, I got, I, obviously I'm not going to go with someone unless I'm sure where it's coming from, so I was sure where it was coming from. And uh, 
It was somebody, obviously, that was close to the situation, very close. And they they let me know, and I broke it on my friend's show because that's what you do for friends. You, you, you try to do nice things if you get a chance to do something nice. And Bill Krakenberger and his partner, John Orlando, and John's quite a guy, you know, his partner. John, do you remember Tony Orlando years ago? You got to remember. You're too young, maybe. Um, but... You get so many haircuts, I can't tell how old you are anymore. But, <laughs> I mean, okay, so <laughs> Orlando, Tony Orlando was as big a star as there was back in the day. I mean, he was a huge singing star, and uh, you know, television singing. Uh, uh, Dawn, what was the partnership he had? Uh, Orlando, what was it? Uh, Tony Orlando and Dawn. Um, on, uh, you'll look it up, uh, look it up. But anyway, Tony Orlando's father, uh, John Orlando's father, was was a tremendous uh, TV star back in the day. And uh, he's the partners with Krakenberger. And him and Bill do a good job with the Wisecracks. That's the name of their show. And I was, the nice thing was, I was on their show and it was their first live show they ever did. Usually it's taped. So we're doing it live. And I, I, I said, you know what? Again, if you can help a friend, what a blessing. What a blessing. What a privilege. What a privilege. Yeah. And so I, I'm glad I was able to do it on his show uh, with two good people like they are and, and so good at what they do. I mean, they're really good at what they do, breaking those those games down, the fights down. You know, they bring the odds to you. They, they, they bring all the background stuff, whatever the hell's going on that you might need to know about. Um, so yeah, so I, I broke it on there. Listen, what does it mean? Well, it means that the fight's going to be postponed, you know, and um, I'll tell you what it means to me. And this is dramatic, right? And I, 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 I'll tell you right now, I'm picking a different guy right now. I'm not picking, yeah, I was I was picking Fury, eyes closed, eyes closed. Look, look, my eyes are closed. I was picking Fury, eyes closed, Ken. And um, he's two-dimensional, he's mentally tougher, he's coming off the win, he broke him down. The other guy doesn't know, you know, he didn't have a fight in between to know if he's going to be okay, if he can handle this. He ha He's had nothing to exercise those ghosts that are in his head, put in his head by Fury. Um... Fury, you know, Fury has shown that he can go walk you down now. He can box with you. He can do either one. Uh, and, and again, he, he broke this guy down. He broke him down to a point where the guy was making excuses, you know, all over the place. You know, I had too many MMNs before the fight. I had a bad Frankfurter. You know, the, <laughs> the outfit was too... I, I mean... I mean, it just went on and on and on. And, uh, you know, so, to the point of, you know, not being so good. I mean, it was a little embarrassing, a little bit, a little bit. He insulted him a little bit. And, and then he fires his trainer, and that was horrible, horrible, horrible. Uh, as a human being, we talk about treating people properly and everything else, right? We talk about that, you know, having a certain etiquette, a certain humanity to you. We just talked about it with Conor McGregor, uh, the realm that you go to, that certain places you shouldn't go. Um, you, you have to behave like a champion. You, you know, it's, it's a responsibility to do that, or it should be a responsibility, not just to fight like one. Well, you know, uh, when Wilder blamed Mark Reel and his trainer of years uh, for poisoning him, poisoning him, poisoning him. <laughs> I mean, that's terrible. You don't do that. I mean, come on. Are you kidding me? Then why was he with you? <laughs> if he had the potential of being a kind of human being that would poison you, why did you have him with you for all those years? Come on. And, uh, you know, so to do that, not to mention Mark Breland is just a salt of the earth type person and a quiet person and just a decent person. Uh, to, I mean, really. So, uh, you know, with all that, with all that, and I give credit to Wado for one thing. He, he demanded this fight. He had the rematch clause. He demanded it. He went to a judge, and they got the fight. He could have got a step-aside fee and waited. No, he wanted the fight. So he, I give him credit for that. I do. See, I say both sides all the time. I give him credit that, you know, he wants to, he, wa he wants to rectify things. He wants to get back with them. But at the end of the day, I was picking Fury because of the things I just said. That, you know, he, he can do more things. He can do more things. And he fights better. He doesn't punch better, but he fights better than Wilder. 
Wada falls all over the place, drops his hands, doesn't know how to get away from punches too well, gets out of position, but he can punch like a son of a you-know-what with that right hand. He's got the, he, he's got the hammer of Thor in that right hand, and he, and he erases a lot of freaking mistakes, and it has, uh, and it has. And it almost did the first time uh, with, with Fury when he dropped him twice. But Fury showed his medal, getting up. He showed his character, getting up. He showed his chin, getting up. He, he showed his, you know, his, his mental toughness, his belief in himself, getting up. His will, getting up. Uh, with all of that said, I was picking Fury. Now I'd have to pick Wilder. Yeah, I know. I just put a bombshell out there to somebody. That, what? What? Yeah, I would have to pick Wilder right now. And I'll tell you why. Because he had the COVID. Because this guy... Uh, uh, listen, I'll tell you, it all depends on when they reschedule a fight, really. But right now, let me tell you. If they keep that... If they're talking about September, they haven't come up with a new date, I don't think, yet. But they talked about... That's too soon. That's too soon. If it's September, I, 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 wouldn't, I wouldn't bet... You know that old saying: "I wouldn't bet your money on on <laughs> uh, on Wild, on uh, Fury. Yeah, yeah. Not if they do it in September. That's too soon. They got to have enough time to get the virus out of his system and to recover and to get a proper training camp too. Listen, there's there's something out there. There's a precedent out there in its own way to point Exhibit A. If you're in a courtroom, you're trying to make a point, Ken. What do you have to have? Evidence, right?" Right? Yep. So here's my evidence. Povetkin, my former fighter, he knocks out Dillian White. He knocks him cold, right? Even at 42 years old. I get it. I get it that he was 42 years old. But he knocks him, knocks him out in their first fight. He was behind. He catches him with an uppercut, knocks him out. And then they have to rematch. During the camp of the rematch, what happens? Povetkin gets the COVID. Did they push it back enough? No, I don't think so. I don't think so. I know it's speculation, but it's more than speculation. Because when he got in that ring, Povetkin, for the rematch, after having gone through COVID, after the fight being put back a little bit, he didn't look right right from the yacht set. He didn't look right, Ken. You saw it. His legs didn't look right. He, he looked like... He looked like uh, your grandmother's spaghetti on a, on a Monday instead of a Sunday. You're supposed to eat it on a Sunday. Supposed to eat it on a Sunday. Monday, it gets, it, gets, it gets soggy. You know what I mean? It's not good. And that's what his legs look like right from the beginning. They, he didn't look right. He looked like he was getting hurt before he got hit. And then he got knocked out in a rematch. And listen, I know he was 42. That could be part of it. But I'm just saying... And why didn't he get enough time? Well, I don't know for a fact, but I do a little bit because I'm around the business. Uh, I'm sure that Mr. Hearn, who's a very good promoter that has Dan White and White's people, I'm <laughs> sure, I'm sure that they kind of <laughs> made it clear to Mr. Perfectkin, if you want this huge payday that we're giving you, because we have to give it to you to get this fight back, to get back on track, to get this win back. So for our career, that we want to go forward and fight for the title we have to get so we have to pay you so if you want this huge payday guess what you're fighting on this date you're fighting whether you're ready or not you're gonna be and and perfecting and his people probably at 42 years of age maybe at 22 they would have done the same i don't know what kind of people they are but they they probably said <laughs> yeah yeah we we do want this yeah we do <laughs> well yeah we'll we'll be ready we'll be ready and maybe he wasn't ready and maybe he was ready maybe i'm wrong maybe i'm wrong but I don't think I'm too wrong. I think I'm within the realm. I think I'm within the neighborhood, Ken. You know what I mean? Yep. Not your of neighborhood. Course. Your neighborhood is way <laughs> out of my league. Way, <laughs> way out of my league. But I'm within someone else's neighborhood. And within their neighborhood. Uh, Eddie Hearns... Eddie Hearns in a big neighborhood. He's a big neighborhood, but not as big as your neighborhood. So, oh, no. Uh, not I as wish big. I had Eddie. Not as big. You know what they say? If I had Eddie's money, I'd burn mine. L yeah. Well, listen. Eddie lives in a castle, but you got the more. <laughs> you got the... <laughs> you, you got the... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, 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 he yeah. literally lives in a castle. Uh, he lives You're in right. a castle. I mean, who lives in a castle? I don't know. I mean, who the frick lives in a freaking castle? But anyway, uh, I digress, uh, as happens once in a while. And, and, you know, I just, again, 
This fight has taken a twist and a turn and a flip and a flop. And with this COVID, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, I just know that if his people, if Fury's people really care about him, which I'm sure they do, you, you better make sure you take enough time. You better make sure you take plenty of time. And yeah, one other thing I want to say when I broke the news of this, um, I'm sure that little little Bobby Tails over at Top Rank, I'm sure that he really, <laughs> I'm sure that he was happy I did, right? Right, Ken? Uh, <laughs> I'm, 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 oh, right. Because he believes in full transparency and honesty. You know, he, he does. You know, he used to be a Boy Scout. A lot of people don't realize that. <laughs> he used to be a Boy Scout. We just can't figure out... We just can't, nobody can really trace back really the, the exactly what legion of scouting he was in, you know, like <laughs> what the, which, which one it was in the Boy Scouts. Nobody can really figure, but we're sure he was a Boy Scout. We're sure of it. Uh, we just don't know in exactly which, which. I'm sure on the day that you broke it, uh, if your back was hurting a little extra, it probably had to do with the voodoo pins he was sticking in the little doll he has well, with your uh, likeness on it. I, I do have to get an anti-voodoo person. You're right. I, I do. I do. To, to kind of work against Bobby. Little, little. You have to call. You got to put the whole thing. Little Bobby. I'll talk to, uh, Bobby. I'll talk to Regis Progray. Progr He's down in New Orleans. Maybe he can recommend a, a, a witchcraft person down there to um, hey, you know protect what? you from the protect you from the hex. Yeah, I, I would appreciate it. Just don't bring me no chicken in a bottle. <laughs> really, really, I, I don't want that. I don't want to have to put that in. And You're then still I traumatized. Grand, then I got my grandsons. Papa, what's that? What's that, Papa? Why do you have a dead chicken in your bottle? Why in your closet? Why, Papa? Why, Papa? I don't know because I'm trying to freaking. I'm trying to. Get rid of these hexes that voodoo people are putting on me and little Bobby and, <laughs> and tails. But, um, you know, uh, Mike Coppinger, uh, just congratulations to him. He just got hired by ESPN. Oh, big um, new job for yeah, Mike Yeah, big job for him. Yeah, and he came up to me. I didn't know. I had never met him before. He came up to me and said hello to me. And you know another guy who said hello to me at the airport? I don't remember his name, but he came over to me. I was getting ready to leave. And he says, Teddy, I'm so-and-so, and, -so, and uh, I'm the matchmaker for UFC. And I said, hey, let me shake your hand. You do a hell of a Shelby? Uh, is that who it was? Uh, That's uh, one of them, yeah. A, a young guy, you know, not a, yeah. like in his 30s, 40s, maybe. And a and, uh, nice guy. And he, uh, he just came over. He said, Teddy, I want to say And I said, hey, you're the matchmaker. You do a hell of a job. I wish we had somebody like you in freaking boxing uh, <laughs> that, that could do the matchmaking uh, the way you do. And he laughed and he agreed. He 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 agreed. He said, yeah. He goes, boxing could use uh, a better matchmaker. There's no doubt about that. If there was such a thing as one matchmaker uh, for boxing, which of course there isn't. But um, yeah, so it was... But as far as the, you know, breaking the COVID news and all that, well, what does it mean? It, it means the fight's going to be postponed. It means that Teddy Atlas right now, if he had to put a bet down and if the fight's, you know, in September or anywhere close to that, uh, Teddy Atlas cannot bet on Fury right now. As much as he, he loves Fury, uh, that's a serious thing. And um, I, it could change, you know, you know that it, it, it could change everything. It can change everything. Yeah. It might not change yep. anything if they got enough time to get over it, but it could. It could. Yeah. It, it, it yep. could dramatically change everything. And um, uh, they better get it right. They better get it right. Pavetkin's people didn't get it right. And again, Pavetkin was 42. I get it. Um, you know, and Darian White was supposed to win the fight. I get it. I get it. But... um. But I also get that Pavetkin, when he got that ring with Darian White after the, after the, you know, after the fight was postponed because he had COVID, he looked like crap. He looked like crap. I, I mean, uh, you know, it, it looked. I mean, well, when they made him touch gloves, he wobbled. I mean, I mean, he he looked like a strong wind. Seriously, and he's a tough guy. <laughs> he looked like a strong wind would have toppled him. I mean, that's that's. That's how bad he looked. So we'll see what happens. We'll see what happens with that. Well, speaking of Coppinger, I sent him a note saying, hey, congratulations on the new assignment. The first thing he said back was, so uh, thanks, and uh, I'm really hoping to get to do some stuff with Teddy over at ESPN. So uh, congratulations again to Mike Coppinger. Um, 
But hey, if you're listening to the show right now and you want to help us out, do us a huge favor. Hit subscribe on the button on the YouTube channel. Like the video. But the subs really help us with advertisers, which help kind of offset some of the costs of producing the show. We've got the most expensive producer in town and our man Rob. He's very expensive. So if you guys can help us out, support the ads, subscribe to the channel, please. It really helps us. It, it, it means a lot to us. That's all we ask. Subscribe, like the show, share the links, whatever you got to do. But the subscription, subscribing to the show really helps. Um, what else you got, Teddy, before we sign off? I know you had a, a very busy weekend in Vegas and uh, it's been a bit of a whirlwind. But man, what a fun weekend, huh? Yeah, I mean, it was great. It was, uh, as I said earlier at the top, it was great to see people living life again, you know, being allowed to live life again, you know, to the fullest, being allowed to go out, enjoy the, themselves, enjoy their friends, uh, be together with people. Uh, it, it was very nice to see that, you know, and um, it, it was, I'm glad you guys were out there. It was great to, to know that you guys were out there, part of that. And um, hopefully, hopefully it's just you know it it will continue in this trend where you know people are getting back to to being themselves. It's so important to be able to you know to live life, to live life. And uh, these poor people that have owned businesses that got crushed, and some of them didn't come back, and some of them are coming back uh, now. And uh, and um, it makes you happy. It makes you happy to see that people out there, whether they're in restaurants, whether they're in the arena, you know, whatever it is that they're doing, that they're out there living and that the people that have invested so much into businesses are, are back in business, are, are, are able to once again take care of their families uh, the way they've worked so hard to do. So it was great. It was it was really, um, it was nice. Uh and hopefully the people, you know, hopefully I won't get thrown out of Detroit. Hopefully I get invited back. They 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 don't invite me back to do fights too often anymore. So <laughs> they don't want the they don't want the truth in boxing. They want the narrative that the promoter is telling them to recite. The end. Talk about the house house fighter. Talk about how one sided the fight is. The house guy's beating the hell out of him, even though he's like his eyeballs hanging out of his head. Whatever the case may be, that's what you're supposed to do if you're calling network fights. Support the network fighter. Anyone who doesn't see that must have blinders on. Anyway, I digress. As you uh, would say, I, I appreciate. It. See, I I always give more credit than maybe they do to the intelligence of the fans. Maybe I'm, I, that's what I do anyway. And and I always figured that and that was my formula for 18 years of doing Friday night fights and then two years of doing PPC fights uh, at, at ESPN and then a, about a year when Top Rank took over, maybe somewhere around there, whatever. Uh, but, you know, I always felt that if you give the, if you tell the truth to the fans, they're going to come back. That if you if you lie to them, you put crappy fights on, and you try to pretend pretend it's a good fight, the fans aren't stupid. They're gonna say, "Why should I come back?" But if you tell them it's a bad fight, which I used to do, you tell them <laughs> that you know they didn't all. Not everyone had, you know, not everyone enjoyed that. The promoters didn't enjoy it too much. But you know, especially before the fight started, <laughs> you know, before <laughs> it even started, I say, "Listen, I'm I'm putting out, you know, I'm putting out a little consumer warning." What? Nobody puts consumer warnings out there for fight. Well, I'm putting a little consumer warning out there that this doesn't figure to be the greatest fight in the world. You know, maybe maybe it's got something to do with the opponent came in on crutches. I don't know. I'm not, <laughs> I'm not sure. I'm not sure. But the, the, the but, opponent uh, was just parking cars uh, outside, uh, and now he's gloving up. Uh, I don't know. But just in case, it might not be. I just want to warn you that it might not be you know and and then they go crazy oh my god teddy can't do that he can't uh, no i can do it you know why because that's our audience that's everything all, the fans and the fighters but the fans that's everything to 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 the business and you got to be honest with them you got to treat them right and if you are my theory and we did pretty damn good for all those years my theory was that if you're honest with them the fans you might warn them about a fight that's bad but they're going to watch that fight anyway because of you course. told them. 
Yeah, because you yeah. told them, because you were honest with them. They're going to say, you know what? I'm going to stay with this guy. I'm going to freaking sit here. I'm going to stay with this. And I'm, I'm going to watch this because I want to see if he's right, number one, because he just said yeah. some, some <laughs> exactly. crazy, bold thing that doesn't get said too often. So, I'm, But I'm going to stay with <laughs> And you know what? I'm going to be there when he tells me it's a good fight. Instead of just ignoring it, which sometimes people do ignore those things because everyone says everything's the greatest fight, you know, uh, since, uh, you know, uh, of all time. You know, everything's the great fight. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's too simple to say that, right? People, oh, this is the greatest fight since, you know, whatever. Um, but if you tell them the truth like that to people and then you tell them it's going to be a good fight next week or two weeks later, they're going to be there. They're going to believe you because they have a reason to believe you. And I think it's good business. So where the promoters got upset that it was bad business, I disagree. It was good business. And it was good for the networks. It was good for the network. It was good for something we talked about earlier, longevity. Because if you're honest, you're going to have longevity. If you go for the quick fix and the BS and, you know, just be the carnival barker, come on in, come on in, see the, see the two-headed, uh, you know, lady and, uh, you know, whatever those carnival <laughs> acts were, the, you know, the snake man. The, beard, and, uh, the bearded yeah, lady. The bearded lady, yeah, the bearded lady with two heads. See, my, in my carnival was a bearded lady with two heads, not, not just, just a bearded lady. You know, we went a little be on Staten Island. We do it a little beyond. <laughs> we do it a little beyond, and, and, and I think if you did that and you do that, you know, like those some people do. I don't know. The, to me, no. But if you tell them the truth, um, if you tell them the truth, I I think at the end of the day you're going to have longevity. I think truth is longevity. I think substance is longevity. Um, that's just how I feel. I was brought up that way. I saw that around me with my father. Um, and I saw the difference sometimes, you know, through the experience of life. So that's just how I feel. But anyway, it's it's it was great uh, doing this show with you. And hopefully, I hope I am invited back. I hope the people out there, uh, you guys, the fans, I hope you enjoyed a tiny bit of what I did. And I appreciate, again, the UFC people, all those guys that really know this stuff better than I do with the MMA, uh, a lot better. I I appreciate that they allowed me into their realm uh, and and tolerated this uh, peon. <laughs> <laughs> You're too humble. Uh, I'm sure they loved you. And uh, thanks again to all the fans. It was great meeting everyone. Great seeing all the people. You guys are the best. We love the fans. Um, Teddy, thanks for doing this. I know, like I said, it was a hectic weekend and we're just getting back. So, um, thank you for the time. Appreciate you. Appreciate all the fans. And with that, hopefully we'll have an interview for you, uh, on Thursday with Dustin. We're just trying to coordinate now with his, uh, schedule and, um, uh, thanks for being with us again. Please subscribe to the show, hit the like button. All that stuff helps. We appreciate you guys and we'll be back with you very shortly. Take care.